the Ten Commandments, number nine, Exodus 20, 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number one, this commandment does not say that you are not to bear false witness. Let me say this at the outset, though, before I even get really started on this. This is the most difficult of the Ten Commandments to interpret, in my opinion. This gives me more difficulty than any other of the ten to be certain about it. And this is partly because of the recently deceased John Orr, who was the wisest man I knew while he was alive, and who heard me, oh, 30 or more years ago, speaking on the Ten Commandments at Westminster College, and he took one exception to what I said, and one exception from John Orr that's about level John Gerstner. He did not agree with my interpretation of the Ninth Commandment. And it's the same interpretation, essentially, that I'm about to give you now. But I'm just as uneasy now as I always have been because John Orr went to his death unchanged on the fact that this is an incorrect interpretation of the Ninth Commandment. Now, a greater man than John Orr, Augustine seems to have disagreed also. I'm telling you that there are people, very, very wise theologians, students of the Word of God, among the very best, who insist that this commandment means thou shalt not bear false witness, period, that under no circumstances is it ever legitimate to lie. I'll tell you this at the outset, so be on your guard. I disagree with them. You'll see as I expound this that I think the commandment properly understood makes it mandatory under certain circumstances to lie. I have to force myself to say that because I can almost hear John Orr in heaven saying, John Gerson, when are you ever going to learn? Your time is running out, and so on. But I must be hopelessly thick or stubborn that I cannot see other than what I'm about to say to you now. But I've given you this preamble just to let you know that far wiser and better men than I think I'm wrong. I wouldn't be giving this if I didn't think I was right, in spite of the awesome judgment of these remarkable men of God. I point out, number one, this commandment does not say that you are not to bear false witness, period. That's not the way it is uttered. It rather says, you are not to bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, I think there's all the difference in the world between saying you are not to bear false witness against your neighbor and God's commanding you shall not bear false witness, period, allowing of no exception whatever. And number three, I begin to explain more fully what I mean. You must bear false witness against your enemy in war. Your duty is to wear khaki clothes to deceive your enemy into thinking that you are part of the foliage so you can kill him. You are to lie in order to kill. Now, to some people, that would be double jeopardy, you see, violating the ninth and the Sixth Commandment simultaneously. We've already shown you that's no violation of the Sixth Commandment to kill justifiably, but only to kill unjustifiably or to murder. Now, I'm trying to show that it is not any violation of the Ninth Commandment to lie to your enemy in war. And this is just a specific example of the way we all lie in America and in Russia and in Germany and any war on any side. We we'll very definitely pretend, if we can possibly get away with it, that we're a friend rather than an enemy. We'll mislead as well as we possibly can. 
And the better we lie, the better soldiers we are. The better able we will be to kill and destroy the enemy. Continuing my statement there, a spy's virtue is being able to bear false witness successfully. You couldn't possibly be a member of the CIA if you didn't lie. You'd have to be a very accomplished liar to be a member of the CIA. If I were the head of it, I wouldn't even listen to your application. If you couldn't show me, you could lie under very adverse circumstances very convincingly. You would have to prove to me you were a polished liar before I would even consider you if I were the head of the CIA or the FBI for that matter when it's dealing with the underworld. Even a football, back, foot, uh, football fullback who honestly tells the opposing line that he's going through center could be brought before the session. You're not supposed to tell the truth. You're supposed to fake a run through center when you go around right end. You aren't a decent liar. You couldn't possibly be on a football team. Wouldn't let you even try out. If you thought it was immoral to deceive the enemy, it's ridiculous. I once, in a college play, pretended to be someone that I was not. Fifty years later, and I am still not ashamed of myself, but I was living a lie. I was pretending to be someone other than John Gerstner, though everybody in that audience knew, oh, that's Jack Gerstner, what's he talking about being so-and-so? He's not so-and-so. I was deliberately lying. I'm playing the part of somebody else whom I was not, and nobody thought I was a sinner. They may have thought I was a lousy thespian, but no one would have made charges of immorality against me on that particular basis. Now, these are all instances of bearing false witness. But you're not bearing false witness against your neighbor. He knows what you're doing. He knows you're not Macbeth. He knows you aren't a piece of foliage. He knows you're not a liar because you go around right end when you fake to pass. Anyone is a neighbor with whom you're not really at war, is what I'm saying, or playing games or something like that. He's a neighbor living in normal circumstances. Now, I, talking to you, out there in my invisible audience, which will later be a visible audience, I am talking as neighbor to neighbor. And I must tell you the truth, what I think to be the truth. I dare not deceive you. I cannot believe the Bible teaches one thing and tell you something other than that. It would make me a liar and as a liar, a non-Christian. I couldn't possibly be a Christian even though I'm teaching Christian theology if I wasn't telling you what I thought was the truth. If I was deceiving you as I would be deceiving a people among whom I worked as a member of the CIA, I would be breaking the Ninth Commandment as I would not be breaking the Ninth Commandment in Greece or in Germany or in Japan if we were at war with those countries. Makes all the difference in the world whether you're dealing with a neighbor, and the neighbor, I think, is properly defined, as I say here in number four, one with whom you're not really at war, you're not in estrangement, you're living in normal relationships, such as the one you and I have at this particular moment. There you must be prepared to die rather than lie. Just as I said to a man when he fixed my car this summer and I drove off in it and it was operating worse than when it was fixed and I came back a little later and I told him the way the car was functioning and he said, well, look, I put this part right in here, right under your eyes and he gave the distinct implication that I was lying and I said to him, I would die rather than lie. 
Well, that was enough for him. He got, raised the hood and he looked under, knowing that this guy really wouldn't be trying to cheat. I think he's telling the truth when he says he would die rather than lie. So he looked around and he did. Sure enough, he found that one part that he thought he had put in, he hadn't put in. Of course, he couldn't apologize. I mean, that, you know, I'm sorry, it's gone out of the modern vocabulary. But he did, he almost apologized. He at least admitted it wasn't my fault. It was his fault, and so on. But it's just the fact that when you're dealing in a normal relationship, I can't say there's something wrong with my car after a man fixes it when there's nothing wrong with it. I can't do that if I'm a Christian, to tell the truth, because he's my neighbor. I never knew the man except in the relationship as a car, car mechanic, but nevertheless, he's my neighbor. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not do what that man thought I was doing, telling him the car was malfunctioning when he was sure it couldn't be malfunctioning and that I was some way or other lying. Number five, a citizen is at war with the underworld. He owes it nothing but to apprehend and deliver it to the law for punishment. We've been mentioning being at war, and we recognize that as a result of a declaration of war against a foreign nation, where it is absolutely necessary for our soldiers to lie and deceive as much as they possibly can, and it's understood that the enemy is going to do the same. There are Geneva Conventions and there are rules of war, but they do not exclude lying and deceiving, as you know. No one can say he's broken. They regulations of war by pretending to be what he actually is not. Now, I'm drawing that a little bit further and showing another area in which I think it is justifiable and indeed mandatory to lie. <laughs> if you see me say that with a particular vigor, it's almost as if saying to John Orr there, John Orr, it is necessary to lie on those cases. A man with whom I'd rather never have to disagree. I always feel I must be wrong somewhere when I do disagree, and yet I, I'm going to my death, apparently, thinking that he must have been wrong. Why in the world can't you see this, you see? But here's the underworld. They're violating the law. They're living by a secret violation of the law, liquidating anybody who would report the truth from them, and so on. You don't owe them the truth. They are not your neighbors. They are not living as decent citizens. They are citizens of another world. It's not another state officially recognized and organized as such, but it's another world which has a life of its own and rules of its own and an omerta of its own and so on, and it needs to be crushed as far as it possibly can be, and if lying will help do it, I will lie to deceive and to betray and to turn the underworld over to lawful authority who will probably release it within the next week, much to the frustration of the citizen who attempts to do his duty. I don't want to be too cynical there, but there is a great deal of that. But thank God there are some who will maintain their war against the underworld, and especially in these days, there's been some real success by law against the underworld of anti-law. Number six, with your neighbor, you must die rather than lie. That's the fixed formula. You cannot lie. I read once someplace or other that the reason the high judges in, uh, in English courts, at least, wear ermine is because the ermine is a, an animal which is so zealous for the protection of the purity of its cloak that it will actually be caught rather than to run into dirt or filth. It would be apprehended and killed rather than besmirch itself in any way at all. A Christian ought to be an ermine. He will die rather than lie. He will not allow himself to be become polluted by the wickedness of deceit. At the same time, with those who are not his neighbors, the story is a very different thing. Number seven, if you lie, you really then die. God will see that you die forever, if not now. 
we look at this simple little formula here. When God makes a commandment, it has to be obeyed. So you die rather than lie where there's a duty to tell the truth to your neighbors. I think we all recognize that's a formula, and I am saying this in the same breath that I'm saying when at war with a sworn enemy or with a underworld or a thief or someone like that, you should lie like a trooper, deceive to the best of your ability, but the commandment is, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, and consequently you must die rather than do that. You must die rather than lie. And now I'm going on to remind you of what I remind you of in all of this ethical discussion. The sanctification is a dying more and more to sin and living more and more to righteousness. Christ gave himself to purchase to himself a people who were zealous for good works. Their oddity is their unbending, unflexible commitment to truth and nothing but truth wherever it is mandatory to be said. Now, if you lie rather than die, as I'm afraid most people would do, they would think where my life is in danger, I am justified in lying. I find no such provision as that in the ninth commandment. And if this is truly your duty with your respect to your neighbors, with respect to decent society, proper society, not at war, to die rather than lie, then if you do adopt what looks like a practical maxim to many people of lying rather than dying, that's when you're really going to die. You're going to save your life now and hear Christ say, what does it profit a man? if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul. This is what you're going to do. If in order to save your life, you violate God's commandment, you are going to die forever. You may escape death now for a few days, a few months, a few years, a few decades, but you will not escape your death before the judgment seat of Christ. You will be sentenced to eternal death there you will die forever. You've got to remember this. You cheat the IRS, you're on your way to hell. You cheat Ma Bell, you're on your way to hell. You cheat anybody, you're on your way to hell. If you give yourself over to lying, even to prevent dying, you're going to die forever. See, once again, let's come back to home base because I know when I hammer away like this, there are people who are troubled. And I've had people call me a legalist because of this type of talk. But let me go once again back to our little formula. Faith brings justification plus works. And here the work we're talking about is truth-telling and denying lying under the circumstances we mentioned. If you allow yourself to lie, a practice in lying, not just over, become, overcome by an insurmountable temptation at a moment and so on, but just simply say, I'm going into examination. I've, I've known students to, know, to say something like this. I'm going into an examination, and there's a decent chance of my flunking it. And if I flunk it, I am not going to be able to go to the college of my choice. I'm going to be getting a beating by my father, and neither father or mother are going to help me go through college at any time. So, I'm going to cheat if necessary. If I can prevent my flunking this exam, I am going to do it by hook or crook, and so on. That person, whether he ever has an opportunity to cheat or not, is a cheat. No, he may never ever crib from somebody else's exam because the proctor is too present and too sharp. He's a liar, and liars shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If a person allows himself in that practice, if any of you young people hearing this know the kind of situation I'm describing, where your life, as it were, hangs in the balance of a certain difficult examination and so on, and you know you run the risk 
of drastic failure and all the bad consequences of that, much as I hate to cheat, I'm going to cheat if I can. One thing is certain, I'm not going to flunk that examination if I can avoid flunking it. Now, whether you cheat or not is beside the point, you're a liar. You're giving yourself to lie, just like that looking at a woman with the intention of having a carnal relationship with her. It doesn't make any difference whether you ever touch the woman. According to Jesus Christ, you've committed adultery in your heart. You're an adulterer. Whether you cheat or not, you're a liar in your heart. You're a liar. Now, if you're a liar, this is the kind of works you're doing which show that this is not a genuine faith. If you have a real faith, you will never give yourself over to lying. So if you give yourself over to lie, you don't have faith, and if you don't have faith, you don't have justification. And if you don't have justification, you know what you do have, condemnation. And that is all. Once again, a religion which only God could think of, a religion of pure grace, where just being united to Jesus Christ brings perfect salvation. But it has to be a real union with Christ. And how can those who are dead to sin by union with Christ live in sin? Utterly impossible. There's no legalism in that. These works don't contribute to this justification anything whatsoever. If you think that, everything is lost. But these works do indicate whether you are in him because they indicate whether your faith is genuine. Faith without works, not to mention faith with wicked works, is dead. And if this work is dead, you are dead ultimately, spiritually as well. We're not challenging, my dear friends, justification by faith alone and the graciousness of the Christian religion. We are expounding what it means in terms of the commandment. Number eight, this commandment teaches us not to hurt our neighbor by lying as the others teach us not to hurt him by disobeying his authority taking his life, polluting his purity, stealing his property, or even coveting any of these assets. Item number eight is just a reminder of how lying fits into the second table of the law. These commandments dealing with man's duty to man. He mustn't hurt him, not to mention kill him. He mustn't lust against him, not to mention commit adultery. He can't take anything or even deny anything that belongs to the man without being a thief of the man's possessions. He cannot actually say any falsity against him without actually showing that he does not have saving faith. And he can't even covet what the man possesses, not to mention stealing them without being devoid of faith. This is the point of the whole examination of the Ten Commandments. Number nine, in war or crime situations, we may hurt our neighbors and countrymen by telling the truth. In war or crime situations, we may hurt our neighbors and countrymen by telling the truth. I think you know what that means without any further development of it. Number 10, at that time, it is not merely permissible to tell a lie. It is a duty to do so. I'm ending on the other side of that coin with which I uh, began. It's not only a crime to pretend to be a German when you're fighting Germany in order to kill Germans. It's actually a duty to do so. See, these commandments all come together here as we understand them more uh, fully. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor doesn't mean you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor at war with you. And then as I say, it's just the opposite. So far from having the obligation to tell the truth to a man at war, which, as I say, John Orr would have to say, I suppose. I may mention, since I've mentioned his name and all and how much he means in my life, uh, let me say this one last word. I've only got a couple minutes left here.
But the last conversation I had the privilege of having with him some years ago, we went over this subject once again. And I said, look, Dr. Orr, are you saying that a person who plays a role in a play is lying? He's pretending to be somebody he isn't. He is lying by saying he's so-and-so and denying he is such-and-such. Now, Dr. Orr, are you saying he's breaking the ninth commandment? You know what Dr. Orr would say at a time like that? Silence for about five minutes. One reason Dr. Orr meant so much to me and very little to other students and so on is that I knew there was oil there, but you had to dig for it. But because I knew there was oil there, I was going to dig, and I was going to dig till I got the gusher. I would get it. It would take a long time sometime. This was absolutely characteristic of him, but in this case, I didn't get a gusher. But at any rate, I waited. And for five minutes after I said, Dr. Orr, are you going to say that when a man pretends to be somebody he is, and everybody knows that he's pretending and so on, he is therefore breaking the ninth commandment, silence, for about five minutes. And you know what he said after that? He said, well, you know, these people who are actors, after a while, seem to forget who they really are. That was all he said. Now, you can see what he meant by that. If you're in the job of pretending to be somebody else, if you're a Brando or uh, who, you know, somebody who's on the screen all the time, you may very well lose a sense of your own personal identity. That's very true but it isn't the same thing as lying, and he wouldn't actually say it was a breaking of the Ninth Commandment, but he would never allow a breaking of the Ninth Commandment, even in that case, I would, but that's where he was very exasperating with me and why I differed with him even to the, the point of his death. But what I'm saying here in this final observation on this particular point is, if I am right, and I think I am right uh, in this point, a person here who tells the truth to his enemy could actually be doing harm to his neighbor. He would be revealing something which would expose his neighbor, his neighbor to enemy bombs, for example, or something like that. If, on the other hand, he lies to his enemy with whom he is at war and so on, he is benefiting his neighbor. He is preventing anything being done to his neighbor by way of lying, which the enemy would practice against him if he had. Now, what I'm trying to say in this very last point, it's not only permissible to lie under the circumstances I have described, but it's actually mandatory. Now, here's Gerstner reaching his absolute nadir, I'm fearing, in the estimate of John Orr when I'm saying slowly and deliberately against the greatest wisdom of the wisest man I knew in my life, Dr. Orr, it's a duty to lie under these circumstances. If I'm wrong, may God forgive me, but obviously I don't think I'm wrong or I wouldn't be telling you, neighbors, a false witness.